All right. I think we're live again today. This is Damon Postalka. I got Andrew Cross with me here on the Eggs of Your Way Roundtable. And our friend with us today is Thane Isaacs. He is a coach, trainer, speaker, radio host of Turfs Up Radio. Thane, thanks for stopping by today. Damon, you know it's an honor to be here, my friend. You know, we've uh, we've taken it offline a few times, but I've always enjoyed the conversations we've had. So I really think it's an honor that uh, you're going to bring me on after getting to know me. That that says a lot. Uh, a lot of people, after they get to know me, they're, they're never going to invite me on their show. So thank you so much. <laughs> uh, I think well, it's good to have you, Thane. I laugh because I know that's why people don't have me on many shows. <laughs> that's fine. But anyway, it's good stuff. Good stuff. Glad to have you here. And you know, today it's it's you know it's all about learning more about you and about how you help people. And and you know, I, I, we were just talking before we got on here. I, I didn't realize you had grown up in Memphis for a while, and and then you're at Texas Tech. And and can I kind of give us a little bit about your background and what kind of brought you to where you are today, helping people? Sure, I, I'd love to do that. You know, I, I grew up being raised by pretty much a single mom. I mean, my mother, it was a, it was a tough life for her. She, uh, she was married four times in about a 20 year span. So she, she could pick some bad men and she, she didn't really help a lot, but regardless, you know, she did her best to raise us. And, uh, there just came a point where I couldn't live in that toxic environment anymore. I was yeah. 19. I, I dropped out of college. I, I finished one semester of school and I decided to drop out of college. I had about uh, $12 in my pocket. My Volkswagen was in the shop broken, my 71 Super Beetle. And I, I just, I had to get out of that. I said, this isn't the way I'm going to be able to have a productive life. And, you know, to be honest, Damon, for a few years, I, I was pretty lost. I was pretty much just moving from spot to spot, living paycheck to paycheck. You know, then I started being a little more successful in life and, and gaining some material things, if that's really gaining. And I asked myself one day, I'm getting, but what am I giving? And you know, I found this guy eventually, his name was Wayne Dyer, and I started reading his books. And it showed me a lot of what I wasn't doing in my life, what I wasn't giving back and what I needed to do. And I got on a path of trying to grow and develop, but I still wasn't finding career-wise what I wanted to do. And this is the moment that I changed my life. Uh, my 14-year-old son and I were having a conversation, he's wise beyond his years, talking about, Dad, you know, you just seem unhappy. I said, you know, I almost feel like I'm failing. I'm not happy at what I'm doing. And we had this conversation. He said, so what you're telling me, Dad, is you feel like you're failing and you hate what you're doing. And I said, yeah, that's pretty much where I am. He said, well, why don't you just change it a little bit and go fail at something you love doing and at least <laughs> you'll be doing something you love and that in itself won't be failing. And yeah, I just I, I made a 180 that day. I I just sat down on the sofa after he said that. And I said, why haven't I thought of this before? And you know, it still took me three and a half years to really get my business up and going. Mm -hmm. uh, but from the day I started it, I worked every day I wanted to until the whole COVID thing hit. Uh, so you know, and it's it's still it's still going. Don't get me wrong, but it's it's it wasn't the same after that. But yeah. you know. Going through that childhood of mine, I just learned a lot of resilience of that you just got to keep going and it doesn't matter who believes in you, you have to believe in yourself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, hey, yeah. You got to believe in yourself. I mean, that's it. Great story. Oh, yeah. 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 That's awesome. That's awesome. And, you know, that's you, you bring up uh, how old were your own, conversation? And yeah, just curious. What's that? What's that? Up? this conversation happened what's that i'm sorry uh, how old was your son when this conversation happened oh he was 14 years old when when this happened he's he's now uh about to turn 21 he's been all over the world doing what he loves and that's you know that's that whole thing that we'd always instilled him but i wasn't living myself and uh, the funny part is uh, that what he's doing is something that when he wanted to do it as a young child didn't even exist, which was a freestyle scooter rider. I don't know if you've seen like the yep. uh, the Razor scooters. Well, his is one that's like a, a you know his like a fourteen hundred dollar version of that. But he's been all over the world. He's been to Denmark. He's been to he's been to Spain. He's been uh, to Berlin. He's been to Mexico, Canada. Uh, mm -hmm. doing what he loves. And now he films and edits for uh, certain snowboard uh, businesses. That he's going around mm -hmm. and, and doing that. He's taking, so he's taking what he loves and he does it pretty much year round. 
Uh, but but it's always because that we've always pushed into him that you've got to go after what you want to do. And my goal for my son is that he never has to punch a clock again in his life. Yeah. Good goal. Yeah, it is. That is. I talked to my son about that as well. I don't know if he's going to have the, have the same ambition to do that, but that's very cool to listen to your son's story about how he is. Uh, actually, and it's even, it's even more telling that, that he's doing something that, if you think about the scooters and, and how that has progressed, it really, when he, when you were talking to him at that point, there probably weren't professional scooter riders that were doing this. And now there are and the, the progression of that sport and many others like it. And just things in general sped, sped up so much. Well, I still have on our refrigerator, on our refrigerator, we have a whole bunch of past memories. And when he was nine years old, his first day of school, they asked him what he wanted to be. And it was a mineralogist, and a freestyle scooter rider. And again, that position didn't even exist. And I can remember him competing in a skateboard, well, they were supposed to let him compete in a skateboard competition at the local park one time. Yeah. And they waited till the end and they said, no, you're not gonna be able to ride. So I told him to go to the truck. And I said, you guys are not very nice to do that. I said, you know, people thought of skateboards that way one time, the way you guys think of scooters. I said, you're gonna regret it because this kid's gonna be famous. And he is, he's one of the top, at one time he's one of the top five in the world. Uh, right now he is uh, focusing more on uh, filming. Yeah. But he's also just become uh, the team captain for uh, an Australian uh, division called Native. And uh, so they're out of Australia, but he's gonna be the team captain for North America. And he may also be riding for another scooter line called Aztec uh, pretty soon and being their team captain for North America. So he's he's still making his progress. But here's the great part is when he wanted to develop his his businesses, because he has about three things going on right now. Yeah. He wanted to start making scooter parts. Now, he's realized he's a little in over his head now. But he what he started doing was he started making T-shirts and selling those to fund the parts to make scooters. Yeah, and he started actually talking to people in Asia about making the dye. He realized after one time he had a, a load of T-shirts get caught up and all his capital was tied up in that. He said, wow, I need a lot more money if I'm going to really make this work. Yeah. So but it was a great lesson, you know, that he's he's understanding this and he's just about to turn 21. You know, so, you know, I just feel like he's on the road to success and, and what he's trying to do is different than what most people do. But isn't that when we find our sweet spot? Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. And that's that's the thing I think that that is really a great example of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it resonates. Uh, it resonates with me, uh, you know, because I started my business about 10 years ago when we were in a terrible economic crisis and I had been furloughed from a job and um, was done doing that. But and I kind of did an, uh, an exploratory and, and to, to find, you know, really what I want to do um, next and kind of stumbled into uh, brokerage, business brokerage, which I didn't even know what was, really was. Um, I'd been involved in deals and when I worked in corporate and stuff like that. But man, I went and hung out with some of the guys and that was a great time to talk to some of the guys who'd been in it forever because all the, you know, all, everybody was getting out of that business at that time because of the recession. And it was, uh, um, you know, and I thought that was a great time to start, but man, I was having fun, you know, getting in to talk to business owners, hear their stories, understand how they built these things, their ups and downs, you know, and how to fix things with a business and, and then go and present and market that to a, to a seller. And I was like, that's a lot of fun, but I don't know. It just now, now let's figure out if I can make a little money doing this too. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, that's, but, that's very key to, to be able to do what you love and make money. It, that's 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 when you hit your sweet spot for sure. But it was a huge box to check at the beginning. And I really wasn't sure, but I don't think anybody really is when they start. Yeah. This is, yeah. you know, um, start there. You know, if you like doing it, you get up every day and you're excited about it. And that's why Damon and I partnered up, too, because he shared the same feeling. Man, this is just like this is fun. Is that we ever going to make any money? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I was like, oh, shit, I can get up out of bed hard every day because I love it. I love this stuff. I love talking with people and business owners and, and, and helping them and, you know, watching what they do and, and, and talking with people like yourself because we get to work with talented people like you, Thane, that, that are helping these same leaders develop their business, getting them doing what they want, getting them, their minds ready 
for really their business to be better and them to be better and are not better, but them to go to the next level, whatever they're doing and, and really give them that, that uh, edge that they need. Cause it's, yeah. it's uh, what, what most people don't realize about uh, leaders. And, and this is something I'd like you to weigh in a little bit on Dana is the loneliness that comes with being a leader. And it's, they, you know, I was I was actually I was working on a blog post about this because, you know, I don't even think people's wives and, and kids and family understands how lonely it is to be an executive or a business owner. And do you see that a lot in the, in the executives that you work with? Yeah. And I, I see a lot of lack of trust and I see which is a little bit sad for, for sharing some things because you, you need that circle. And something Michael Rivera and I are doing, we, we started a mastermind group to help people like that, to come into, to be able to talk with us about problems like this, about certain issues in their business that they don't have anyone to talk to. And, uh, you know, not to put a, put a big ego on my head, but, you know, we're both pretty, uh, pretty well versed in what we're trying to help people with. Mine is, is developing leadership and personal growth. And Mike is, Michael is helping people financially and uh, plan their life out a lot better and just being able to have a, a voice like that where you can trust people, a safe spot is great. Uh, but it would be nice if more owners took some of the people within their immediate circle and brought them in their, in their umbrella. And I found when I've done that running a business, Damon, that I actually built a family and I didn't just have a business, it was a family. And I, the, the proof was in the pudding, I uh, remember leaving and making a scrapbook for me called the house that Thane built that put tears in my eyes the day I was walking out the door. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, I didn't build it. We all built it together, but it was just that whole family attitude yeah. that, that we had. And that's so important to me. And that comes from, I didn't feel lonely in that spot because I had my right hand people, my top seven people right there to know it's like, I can share these things with you. I can let you know what's going on. And I think that comes from, leaders being willing to be vulnerable, which I think that yeah. they, they don't do that enough because they're so afraid. I hear it every time I deal with people, Damon, well, I don't, I can't let them know that I'm going to, I made that mistake. And it's like, okay, mm -hmm. well, once they find out you made that mistake, now you've lied to them. So what's easier to overcome that you made a mistake or that you betrayed them. And I always think it's easier to overcome my, my flaws, unless that flaw is lying to you. It's yeah. just to me, that's the way it is. And so that's what I, I implore leaders to do is be more transparent, be more open with what you're doing. You know, don't get don't give the falsehoods because your people are smart. They're going to find out. They're going to figure it out. And when they do, the jig is up. And now what are they going to trust you the next time they ask you a question? What Are they going to grill you harder? Or are they just going to have disbelief and say, we can't believe what he says? What does it matter if we ask him or not? So mm -hmm. that's one of the things I implore leaders to do is to be be willing to be vulnerable be open, be as transparent as you can. And, you know, sometimes I've even heard, Damon, well, you can't share all this information. You can't share all this information. What are they going to do with it? I mean, you know, they're not going to start a business with it. They're not going to, they're not yeah. going to sabotage the business. I even like people to know what I made as the head person. And my boss asked me, why do you do that one time? I said, so they know if they kick my butt out of the seat, what they can make. Because I always told everybody, take my job from me, please. Yeah. Work, work me out of a job because if that happens, there's going to be more opportunity for me. Yeah. You know, yeah. that. So it's it's that fear we have of people taking our position sometimes that we also don't share that information with. And my belief was when I left the business, I wanted to perform better than it ever did under me. Mm -hmm. And that was always the legacy I was able to leave behind. Yeah, well, it's really interesting that, you know, because I was thinking about that a little bit yesterday, too. We were talking about our, our clients, too, and see our the business owner is especially the small and medium sized business owner. Um, you know, and a lot of this is because they're under siege. I mean, constantly. Um, it is probably the hardest thing to do. They aren't getting a lot of help. Um, and then, you know, uh, they get burned a lot. You know, it, it, things are or. You know, they'll spend money on things that, that don't don't work out the way it was, you know, that, that they said it would. Um, you know, the, the government makes it hard for them. To, you know, getting a capital is is very difficult to do. Um, employees, uh, you know, it's just constant. Um, and it just seems like it, that, I think a lot of it has to do with, um, you know, there's that fearful, you know, fearful paranoia of just having been burned so many times that they just close up. And 
Um, it, 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 it takes, a, you know, to me, I'm just really impressed with a leader who can let go of, the, you know, you put that behind them and just keep moving on and still trusting and still getting people, you know, still trying, you know, the, the things that work um, rather than just going into the turtle shell and hiding out until it's over. But Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, yeah, it, it is. As you said, Andrew and, and Thane, it's, they, they do need to be more, the leaders need to be more transparent with people. And I know people use transparent a lot, but man, we're all human. Right. And the, and hell, let's, let's, let's be, let's be realistic about it. When we were starting out in leadership, the mantra was, you know, no one knows your faults. That's what we were taught. It was beat into our heads. No one needs to know that. And, and that's just not the way to a, it's not the way to do it. B it doesn't work. And, and, you know, we're still fighting a bit of that, I think, but when, when people understand that you know you're going to make mistakes but you still make the same you still make decisions i think they they have more respect for you knowing that you're doing that decision you're making those decisions with the best information you have and you're going to live and, and stand behind them even if you make the mistake I, I think what you just said is so key damon especially with all the changes people are dealing with right now that we're going to give you the best information we have then when the new information comes, we're going to share that information. And that information can change at the drop of a hat right now quicker than it ever has. And people need to yeah. be understanding. But it's once you cross that line of telling them something false, and then you have to go over that, that's where the, the trust is betrayed. And it's very hard to get trust back once it once it is lost. But I, I, I have what you were talking about, Andrew. I have seen those owners who have been burned a lot. And that has what has caused them to, what you said, go into that shell. And you just have to reach out to them and say, look, you just need to be a better judge of people and make better decisions. But please don't think that everyone here is out to take your fortune away from you. Everyone's not here to to try to usurp your power. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. Into your bank account. And yeah. uh, it, that's the rare, rare beast that does that. And, you know, it's it's sad that it happens. But please don't don't yeah. run your life that way. So I've, I've lived that many times. Yeah, I, 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 I uh, you know, worked with a, cl a client who, in, a, in a metal fabrication business, um, you know, you know um, contract manufacturer, really, but just absolutely tight as a drum, you know, always constantly that everybody was, you know, stealing from them and, and worried about that. But I was like, I think what you said, I said to him, I didn't last very long there anyways with him because I said, uh, you know, you, if this isn't, you're, you're a fab shop. This isn't rocket science, you know, <laughs> people can figure out what the, what's going on here. Um, you know, and we do the same thing here too. Uh, we try to do yeah. that. We try to practice what we preach when we work with clients that exit your way. It's, um, Hey, we'll show you exactly how to do it. We'll tell you all of it. Go ahead. Yeah. Cause it really isn't there. You know, exit your way is a process. It really isn't, I'm mean, happy to tell you exactly how it works and, and go do it. It's not, um, you know, uh, it, it, that's not what gets it done. You know, it's the people involved in it that get the things done. You know, they kind of follow the guidelines, it, you know, and there's, and there's work, but it's really, um, if, you know, I'm not, I don't have any problem, you know, even helping people telling them all the steps to go ahead and do it. Um, but you know, you, you, you need to go out and get the help to do it. That's what, what it's about. Yes. Yeah. No yeah. one does it alone. <laughs> no, no, you, guys, you guys are the emulsifiers. That reminds me of being at a, I I'm come from the green industry and being at a convention one time and hearing this guy who was the keynote speaker. We were asking him questions about the generic versions that sell to other people. And they said, yeah, but they're, we give them the, the formula, but we don't give them the exact emulsifiers that we use to increase the effect, efficiency of the product. So mm -hmm. you guys are the emulsifiers. That's what you do. You make you, it's like, yeah, here's the information. You have all the ingredients, but we put it oops, we put it together to make it work the right way. So yeah. you, can, you can pay for the generic information or you can pay us and we'll, we, we, are, we actually make this where it works and is efficient uh, because you're right. People will get off track. They will say, well, uh, perfect example. Uh, I worked with a guy one time and he, I was talking about my wife's fried chicken. He said, Oh, fried chicken. That's my favorite. I love, I love fried chicken. So I said, okay, I'll, ha I'll next week when I come up, I'll, I'll have her make some and I'll bring you some. So I did. He said, Oh my, this is the best fried chicken I've ever had. The best fried chicken in the world. Can I have the recipe? I said, nah, I don't know. He said, yeah. Oh, please. I've got to have the recipe. I knew where this was going to go. Cause I knew how he was working with me. 
So the next week, I brought him the recipe, handwritten by my wife, and he read it. Yeah. And what came out of his mouth was, do I have to do all of this? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wait, wait. Your favorite food is fried chicken. You said out of your mouth, not mine, this is the best fried chicken I've ever had. Which there are people who have told me that hundreds of times about her fried chicken. And then you ask me when you read the ingredients, do I have to do all of that? That's why you've been having the same results because you're not off of the things we're talking about because you're not implementing everything. You're doing the things that are going to be the easiest and you can get done. It's the same way with probably some of your clients that you guys work with, right? Well, yeah, it's, it is. It is because we can show somebody, and you know this too, it, you can show somebody exactly what to do. And the fact of the matter is, most people in business are, are busy with the business, right? They're busy with the business. But to, to do the improvement work that needs to be done to take your business to the next level requires, I got to work on my business, but I got to work on this too. That's going to improve my business. And they're mm -hmm. stuck in here working on the business and they don't get to working on the improvement because it's easy. It's easy. If your business is going okay, there's really getting to the improvement is a nice to in a lot of people's mind, but over the long term, that nice to becomes more need to. And yeah. Well, one of the questions I ask people, Damon, is okay, so if you're working on the business, who's building the business? Or if you're building the business, who's working on the business? Because they're not the same thing. And I get the deer in the headlights there. Do you guys ever get that as well? Yeah. 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 Definitely. Oh, yeah. Constantly. Yeah. Um, you know, and this is what is um, because of where we work in the in the lifespan of a business at the exit when buyers are coming to look around. Um, it revealed nothing. You can't hide anything. Yeah, um, you know, I mean, if there's flaws in there, if, if the wrong people are, are are in the wrong seats, if the processes aren't tight, if uh, you know the technology isn't up to date, you know, um, you know, all these things, the culture isn't correct. It, it, it uh, it's going to come out. Yeah, you know, yeah. we want to want to sell a business. So with, with those and, clients that were selling their business, yeah, it is, it is, it is key because that diligence process is brutal. And, and they, they don't realize that they're not ready for it. And even in our clients, you know, because we're working with a, a fair amount of clients, too, that are, you know, they're five or more years away from their exit. They just want to be growing their businesses and running good businesses. And I'll tell you, when you see them after a, after a year, figure out, OK, this is why we measure everything every week, because then we go to the months and we know that we're going to be fine on our financial stuff. And then you see it six, eight months down the road when the sales are starting to take off better and the cash starts to build in their bank accounts and the, and the, and they look at that weekly report and they go, boom, it looks like we hit our numbers pretty good this week or we got something to look at. We need to investigate that. They get that and they go, okay, this is, they can take a little breath back, like step back and take a breath and go, I kind of got a handle on, I can see if it's running well or not. And that's the first thing that really comes into mind. And then when we start to talk about you are either working on improving, as you said, building the business, and that's usually we're talking about revenue, or you're making your business run better. What mode are we in right now? If it's just one person or if it's multiple people who's doing what? But once they start to figure that out, that you have to switch between those different roles, A, you got to get your business under control. You got to know what's going on. But then you can switch between those roles or get people assigned to them. They really start to have fun with it. It's, it's a fun process to see their mind start working at that because every business owner gets into business, goes into business because they're good at something, you know? It could be there, as in your example, I think you, you're come out of the landscaping industry, correct? Correct. Yeah. So these are these are people that grew up loving that and loving doing that probably and thought they could go out and make money. They didn't think about running a business. They, they thought about being being really good and doing cool landscaping work. And that's what every business owner. I don't give a rip who you talk to. That is the underlying thing that we see every day. And we teach them how to run a business and still have fun doing what they like to do. That's that's key right there. And, and kind of one of the things maybe you even tell your son, because one of the things uh, a friend of mine, Chris McAdams, and I were talking about his son. He said, well, he doesn't want to go into business for himself because he doesn't want to be a businessman. I said, OK, so he wants to work for a businessman. 
And the, the kid was like, wait a minute, what do you mean? I said, well, it's one of the two. You're either going to be, you're either going to run your own business or you're going to work for someone who is a businessman, unless you're just going to get charity. And he started, it, Chris said, it made him start thinking like, wow, I, I probably do want to go into business for myself then. Uh, because, you know, you're either going to work for that person, or you're going to be that person. And I would prefer to be that person. And, and you're right. We can't be all things to, to, and we can't be great at everything. And that's why uh, it was even on the radio show last night. We talked about that people need help. And I'm not talking about reaching out to me. Yeah, sure. I would love for people to reach out to me, but reach out to somebody. If you're out there struggling in business and there's something you don't understand, there's someone out there who can help you. Don't struggle. Don't don't go through it blindfolded and trying to hit targets. You know, take the blindfold off, reach out to somebody and say, hey, I need some help with this. I know you guys help people in certain ways. I help people in different ways. But there are so many hundreds of thousands of coaches out there, advisors, whatever you can find. But the last thing you want to do is go through business thinking you got this. And then two years later, finding what you've been doing was wrong and it's been costing you money when all you had to do is change something. Yeah. 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 And, and, you know, that's one of the things that I, I always tell, tell business owners too, and, or anybody that's considering, you know, looking at a coach is don't ever sign something long-term until you know, it's going to be a good fit. I mean, I, I, we had a client, it was a couple of years ago, a uh, wonderful, wonderful person. And, and literally was, was uh, very distraught at the fact that she had gotten herself into a, a, I mean, a smart business person. I uh, gotten herself into a, a situation with someone that made her sign a long-term agreement. She got into it about three months and it was a year term and they didn't let her off it. Wow. And, and that's the, and, and it, it's those kind of things is where, where people get burned. They get a lot of, a lot of uh, distrust for the, for coaches, but really the good coaches will, will allow you to get to know them to understand because if you're a good coach, like, like you, you are, I mean, you want them to be as happy with you as you are working with them. And when, when we, when we approach clients, they, they get a little bit kind of almost, it's not, it's a strange reaction when we, when we say, Whoa, 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 we, we don't know yet. <laughs> we don't know yet. That call this qualification process here takes us a while because you know, you know, you, you don't want to work with us just as badly as we don't want to work with you if it's not working. Right. Yeah. No, that's, that's horrible chemistry. And, you know, that's one of the things I, I do that uh, weekly classes, uh, 1995 a month on through, you know, that people can join as five classes, uh, uh, four or five classes a month. And that way people get to know me and yeah. then people reach out and say, wow, I'd, I'd like to work with you one-on-one -on -one. Or they say, oh, my gosh, this guy is a fruitcake. Why would I give him a dollar a month, much less anything? But it's just a way to get people to come in and, first of all, find out if they're willing to invest in themselves. That's the key thing to me is are you willing to put the time in? It's not about the money. 20 bucks a month, you're spending that at Starbucks. You know, yeah. it's, it's about the time you're going to invest. It's an hour to an hour and 15 minutes every session. I do four of them on Tuesdays, and people come in. And we talk and we talk about developing. We right now we're doing John Maxwell's 15 invaluable laws of growth. And uh, this again, just again, a good starter to say, yes, this is something I want to do, something I want to invest in myself. I want to make myself better. And some people just want to stick with that. And some people want to go further and deeper. Uh, and then people even want to go deeper than that. So uh, it all depends on what you're willing to invest in yourself. I love to work with people. I love to see people change and, and grow. Uh, but the, the, one of the best things for me is when people are actually taking notes. That's, that's when you know you're making a difference. When they're taking time to actually write down what you're talking about, uh, that means they want to remember it. So that's, that's one of my uh, great moments is when everybody on the call is looking down like this and, and doing that. So, um, but that's, that's, that's a way to, again, to get to know somebody, spend some time with them. Because, again, there are some people who have been in the class that I would not want to coach one-on-one. -on -one. I, I, I would not be effective with them. And yeah, yeah. Uh, so that you're, you're 100 percent right about that. Yeah. Andrew, Andrew, do you do you, uh, do you guys when you get in there with with businesses, I, I have when I work with business, I have 10 questions I go through to answer for myself and do a report. Do you guys have anything like that or is yours a little less general, a little less, a little less specific? I mean, no, we we have a we have a specific process that we go through. Uh, it, it is a, it's a discovery process too, because what we're heading into with a a business owner 
um, especially in this case, it, it, it's a lot of them are pretty set in their ways and have been doing this for a long time and, and how they do their businesses in their head. And they have to make some, if they want to sell a, build a company that an investor would buy or a, a private equity group um, and, and get a higher multiple and really cash in on that opportunity, they got, they've got to be ready to make some hard changes. Um, and I just liken it back to our manufacturing days when um, the lean manufacturers came in. It, it, it is a kind of a, a matter of survival, but if you don't, if you don't come in and get a commitment from leadership or from ownership from the top, um, it, it's not going to happen. I mean, we had to walk away from a client the other day because it was his managers that wanted to do us to come in and work with. They wanted to change. The owner was barely too busy to even come and talk to us, you know, for 20 minutes on a call, called in, didn't video, didn't want, you know, we could tell right there. This, I mean, it's just, it's, you know, they still, we probably still, they would have given us the work. But we said, you know, you know, it, it, he's just not there. And, and he's, he's happy with the way the business is running. You guys may not be. <laughs> you know, but you, you guys work on changing these things yourselves. But, you know, unless you get your your buy-in from the top, it's, it's you know, we can't do it. And we're we're going to be working here for two years. And, and, uh, and, and you know, uh, things are going to. Things are going to change and move yeah. people around. It's going to be good. But um, without that, we, the way we do it is we don't want to be there unless we can be successful. Yeah. That's a lot of time and effort. Damon has actually shared a story or two with me on a previous conversation about somewhere you guys had, I don't know if you were still with them at the time, if you had been with them at the time, if you guys have been together the whole time. But he was just telling me a story that got pretty in depth and cost a lot of money. I'm sure there are multiples of those that are, you know, just like, bang your head on the wall. Why did we do it? Uh, but I'm sure as time's gone on, you've also become pickier because of things you've learned, uh, taking that information of, of those bang your heads on the wall and going, no, nope, this looks about like that again. No doubt. Absolutely. You know, I think business owners too, a lot of them don't learn this in, in business school. Don't, they're not book people. They're not learning it from a book. It's trial and error. They, they learn how to do something. They go out you know, they've, they've got a skill or a trade and, and they, they figure it out. They, you know, they do marketing that way. They and they run around doing that kind of stuff. So and I think we're kind of the same way with our partners in XE way and, and all the experience we've had. So come to us because um, if you learn from your mistakes, we, we're pretty good. We've done it all. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and, you know, we, we do, as, as, as you do too, Thane, when, when you're, you're talking about people that you couldn't uh, coach one-on-one -on -one in your class and, and our discovery process is very, very um, um, structured. And, and I say there's there's stages to it. And the information that we request is tailored for a certain reason. And when you get into it, the small uh, differences in the way the information comes to you, that in the timing, in in the questions that are asked, and the question, the follow up questions, and the response to those. All of that allows us to understand how that that business is running, and and we don't we don't realize this about ourselves or the people or, or businesses or anything around us, but it's the small inferences, the way we say words, the words we choose, how we write, the time, the response, everything affects. Uh, it says a lot about us and and our, the businesses that people work in and we we've, we've had to honestly get to that level because you can walk into somebody that's going to pay you enough money that you go oh gee i mean you know somebody's going to in, in in our the three of us is our kind of work if somebody's going to throw you 20 30 50 thousand dollars a month you're like going well geez that's that's but you gotta you gotta be you gotta be strong enough to stand up and say no right. because you can be down the road 12 months they're out a quarter of a million dollars or more. You're out a year of your time, which is maybe a lot more valuable than that. And nobody's happy. Right. Yeah. And, and that's and that's the big thing, you know, and and the better that people get. And I, I didn't realize this until a few years into it. And with Andrew and I, a couple of years into it is is you hear these these people that are really pretty successful in, in consulting or advisory or coaching. They say saying no is what you've got to learn. Right. Mm -hmm. Because everybody, everybody that's an entrepreneur, as you start up, runs through the same thing. They don't get enough work, and then they get enough work, and they realize that you got to get rid of the work that's not the right work. 
I feel like a lot of that comes from values is lining values up with each other. And, sure. and that's where I try to find what people's top five values are. And if, if none of those line up, I probably shouldn't be working with them. If a few of them line up, there's a chance. If all of them line up, then we're going to have harmonious uh, results. Yeah. But when you, when you, you know, and I'm working with a, a business owner who has finds no value in people, I better walk away pretty quickly from that because we're probably not going to get very far because I, I, I that's where everything starts for me. Uh, it, it does start at the top, and that's a person. But it's also if you're if you have people who are unhappy, how are they going to make the customers happy? If you have people who aren't energized, how are they going to do energetic work and I want customers to be very, very well taken care of, but in order for that to happen, the team has to be taken very well care of. And if people could just understand that, and so many don't, uh, I, I, I would say probably 60 to 70% of leaders don't, who are supposed leaders, don't understand that. And yeah. you'd get so much more return on your investments if you just took care of, of people. And that's, that's always been what I believed in and what I've seen work. Well, we can we can prove you're right, you know, because well, let's bring a buyer in and show them, introduce them, and go into diligence, and have have a company with an offer of twenty five million, and have them go in and do all the meet and greets with the management leadership team, and it's over, because you can tell by their body language. It, it, sometimes it's I've been in those meetings. I well, and I avoid that now because we get to work because. You know, you've got to fix this because if they walk into that meeting, they, they can. That's one. Of, that's like number one. Financials, very important. Right, right behind that, the people. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, you're, you're buying systems. You're buying the business. But if you have to replace all of the people, well, what an expense that's going to be. I mean, that's that's whatever whatever the salaries you're paying. That's one and a half times the salaries at a minimum just to to go through that process. You don't you don't want to be doing that, especially buying a new business. So I, I, I agree. I, I really hadn't thought of that in, in that aspect uh, a lot. I mean, I did have a conversation with someone yesterday doing with culture when you're trying to change culture, when you're trying to change a business, uh, even if the ownership is in, in like buying into it. But middle management isn't conveying the message down to the front line that you've got a problem because they they're comfortable in what they're doing. They don't want things to change. They don't want to have to take on new responsibilities and roles. So you've got to make sure that everyone understands what the purpose is behind it and what everyone's role is and that everyone's buying in, which can be mm -hmm. difficult at times. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, and, and uh, the savvy buyer um, in an organization is looking for that. If there's if there's a good, strong culture. And, uh, you know, and they've got well-defined leadership groups and, and leadership teams and they, they walk in there. They're going to just go talk to them in an hour. They're going to know, yeah, these guys, this, I want this and I'm going to pay a premium for this to get just to have the, the people are the assets. They're an asset. It can and, also be a liability. Back up to any time in the business, though, too. I mean, you see in this thing, it, yeah. when you develop your people, and just like the example you said before, taking care of your customers on a daily basis, it doesn't matter if it's if it's your your VP of sales or the person that's you know serving you a burger at, at, at the local restaurant. If those people are treated right, if they if if you're if you're putting them in the right environment and and leading them the right way, that that leads through all the way you know, from the beginning of your ownership to the sale, and it, it, it's what businesses are built on. I don't care how automated your business is. I don't care how much equipment you've got. It comes down to the people that are there is as to how successful you're going to ultimately be. Oh, I, I'm so in sync with that. You know, I mean, I, I look at, I've seen where someone, a business I've been working with where someone comes in, in the morning and they're getting chastised about something from the day before, then they're expected to answer the phones and be cheery. And it's like, I understand that things have to be addressed, but there may be different ways to address them and to give constructive criticism. And not. And it's, it's always to me about addressing the behavior, not the person. And it's not that you're stupid. It's that, hey, this isn't wasn't a very great thing we did. How can we avoid happen, making that happen in the first, first place? You're so smart. I expect a little bit more out of you than, you know, this is the dumbest thing. How You're so dumb. How can you do this? And me having to talk to somebody saying, you can't address people that way. But then you expect that person to get on the phone and talk to their customers as, oh, hello, we're here to help you and serve you. It's, you know, it, it's, yeah. not, 
no, it's not. It's, they're going to do. Hi, this is. Uh, we're we're here. You know. And uh, so, you know, we have to keep that kind of stuff in mind. How we address people is how they're going to address, how leadership addresses the, the team is how the team is going to address their customers. So let's, yeah. let's be proud of everybody. Let's show everybody how incredible they are and what a benefit they are and how important their job is and what they do matters. Let's teach people that. And then when they're talking to people, they're going to be proud of themselves. I matter. What I'm doing matters. I've been told what I do matters. Let me tell you how what I do matters and I'm going to make your day and that's going to make it even better. And well, you know, that's, that's, yeah, that's, a, that's a great example. And I, you know, I think even the best leaders um, that I see come in don't have to go in and if they've done it right, if they built the right and the culture's right, they don't have to go in and correct the person. They actually, the person's correcting themselves, the employees. It's more about even, uh, you know, I've seen the better leaders is, is coming in to say, Hey, don't be so hard on yourself. <laughs> yeah. You know, stuff happens. Right, because yeah. they're, yeah. they're punishing them themselves. They're not getting dressed down by uh, exactly or something like that. That's when I say, "Wow, that's." And I notice though, that's a little tiny thing, but you notice it, right? It, it's uh, because the people care and they're being perfectionists on themselves. That that's where you want to be. But that's because they know what's expected of them, and they they enjoy succeeding, and they they've got a way to measure their importance and and get you know so the feedback loops are tight and yeah so. It's part of what you're helping people with too, Lane, in your in your coaching is that you know when you look at how that 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 supervisor, that manager, that owner of the business, whoever it is, talks to those people in the business. There's two different ways to do it. I mean, I've got a friend of mine, Eric Bloom, always talks about the the Dale Carnegie, how to win friends and influence people, or whatever that book is, I've I got it on my, I was looking at my phone here, just to remember who wrote it and stuff, because I think I wrote that book like in the 50s or something like that, or, or even earlier than that. And the basic principles in there, as you said, uh, mentioned in, in that customer service example, there are two different ways to talk to that person to say the same thing in the, in the right way. Well, they will come out of it inspired to do as Andrew, Andrew said, to make sure that they do better next time without you having to, to belittle them or do any of that. Well, that's that whole communication tool that is so misused in our society. I would say communication is probably the most misused tool in any business I work with. And, you know, so that's where we have to be sure we're clear on things. And, uh, you know, I've seen so many places that don't even have a procedures manual. And I'm not talking about be on work on time, da, da, da. I'm talking about this is how you enter this work because when someone doesn't show up, then nobody else knows how to do the work and, and people are confused. People are frustrated. And what does frustration cause? Frustration causes anxiety. It causes people to get angry. So, you know, it, let's eliminate as much of that frustration as we can by setting these policies and procedures in place. And again, yeah, being on time and all that, those, those are things that are important, but those things should be understood. I'm, I'm talking more about the operational aspect so everyone can follow it. And I know it takes time, but what takes more time when you're, I, I've seen this, Damon, so this is not an exaggeration, when the person who is the only person who knows how to do payroll is out for a week and a half. I, I, I've, I've seen that. I mean, it's actually happened. So, um, you know, it's like, well, I, I've been asking you to do this. Maybe now we'll get this going now that we, we've seen this. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. it's amazing that's an important one too yeah yeah that's the time here. <laughs> that'll get some attention people will pay attention and figure things out when the payroll is not on time that's for sure yes and you get angry people so yeah yeah so so thing you, you got a radio show now that how long have you been doing this i want to say we're in the sixth week seventh week i i, I lost a little bit of a track of it but it's Curse Up Radio, three wise guys, Stephen Cohen, Adam Linneman. Uh, they're both very successful in the green industry still. I, I consult in the green industry. I have a history since I was 15 of working in the green industry. Uh, what, what got me out of doing it was I started consulting with people and uh, had other businesses reach out to me, property management businesses, insurance businesses, auto dealers, all kinds of, all kinds of places reached out to me to help them. So I changed the name from a landscape name because everybody I would go to work with will also ask me, do you cut grass? And I, well, I used to, I haven't cut, I mean, I cut my own. Uh, so I, I took the landscape name out of it, but I still work with a lot of green industry people. That's where I'm known a, a lot for some of, uh, some of what I, what I've done in my life. But I, at the same time, 
I feel like there's a bigger realm of people. And it's, again, as you both said, it's all about the people. And I don't care what line of work you're in. People want to matter. People want to be a part of. They want to be heard. Being heard doesn't mean what they say has to be implemented. It just means that they've been listened to and maybe explained why that can't be implemented now. Um, it's basically the golden rule. I mean, I hate to be that way, but life is the golden rule. Treat people the way you want to be treated and then go a little bit further and treat them the way they want to be treated. And if you can figure those two things out, you're going to be a lot more successful as a leader because then people will follow you because people really do care how much you care about them. They really don't care that you have all this great following, that you have 27,000 people following you if you don't care about them. At least the people I know, the people I want yeah. in my life. So uh, that's that's one of my philosophies. I mean, you know, I, I we, my wife and I raised our children to believe that no one is better than them, but they are better than no one, that we're all equal. We all walk on the same ground. And, you know, right now my personal mission is just trying to help people have, see more value in themselves. It's mm -hmm. my personal and my business vision, mission. So many people are having trouble doing that uh, because of all the struggles we're going through. So that that's my personal mission. And by seeing people as people, and we, we never, you know, it's like it's the woman in the green shirt. It's it's the man with three kids over there in the checkout, you know, or whatever. But just try not to 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 make those those differentials because I want my people, my children, to see people as people, and they can make their own their own decisions. I, I if 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 they want to use that terminology, they they can, but but they don't. That's just not who they are. So um, I feel yeah. like I that's that's been part of the benefit of us. Um, raising our children with the kind of same spirit we have in our hearts. That's, yeah. uh, that's good words. And it pays off. It all pays off. And it not only, um, you know, professionally or, you know, uh, monetarily, it pays off just personally and, and hey, it's just a better way to live. Well, yeah. And I, I'm sure you've seen this, right. um, you know, that you raising your kids in that environment, you're going to see them interacting with others doing it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, my, my, you know, my son is, is um, he has this business called Evil Corporation, which is kind of a, a, a rip off from the, the movie I've never seen, but I've heard there's another Evil Corporation out there. Anyway, he, he does these t-shirts that I told you about, but he also does these exclusive stickers. You can't buy the stickers. You, you can't. Um, but recently he sold about $800 worth of them and donated them all to charities uh, to, to help people out during these times of struggle, which he didn't even tell me about till after he'd done it. And I was just like, wow, you, you, you shame me, my son. So, uh, so he, he like sold them out really quick, did like $500 worth, sold them out. Then he did another $300 worth, sold them out the next day uh, and said, okay, well, that's, that's, that's pretty incredible. So it makes you feel proud that, that they do those kind of things. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's great. That's very cool. Well, thing has been awesome talking to you today, and you know, it we just it's been a while. We wanted to get you on and 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 let you explain to people how how can someone get a hold of you if they're if they want to talk to you a little bit more. If someone wants to talk to me, 802-770-4061. Get a number. 802-770-4061. You feel passionate, man. You can email me at faneisaacs at tomorrowinnovated.com or starting Monday, I'll be back taking a little sabbatical from LinkedIn to get some focus in and you can direct message me on LinkedIn and say, hey, Thane, you are a complete nut job. Why would I want to connect with you? you know? <laughs> oh, that's so great. It's so great that you come right out with a phone number, man. I, I just love that. I love that. You know, I, I'll talk to anybody, Damon, you know, and then I can block you if I don't want to talk to you later. So it's kind of like, kind of like you having me on your show. I, I figured, you know, after our first conversation, be like, all right, time out, technical. But we, you know, we, kept, we kept it going, my friend. We kept it going. Yeah. Well, I think uh, great. We're, we're a crazy bunch together. And, it, and it's just good to have have uh, interesting people like yourself. I, I always love talking with you and, and learn a lot. And, you know, I love your videos. If people haven't watched your videos that you're doing while walking with your dogs out by your house, you live in such a beautiful part of the United States that um, I, I just tell people, look on your LinkedIn and, and mm -hmm. watch the videos because, man, you, you, you've got some really good stuff you, you talk with people about. So awesome to have you on. Appreciate it. Um, everyone else is listening. Thanks for listening today. I got some comments from Ira Bowman, Jonathan Albany. Uh, abalone excuse me 
Um, I'm not too great with the names right now, but hey, thanks a lot for looking. And, uh, and we'll, we'll be back again uh, next week and uh, with a little bit more. But Thane Isaacs with us here today on the Exit Your Way Roundtable. All right.